Great to see you all uh, at the RSA here in the Great Room. Fantastic to see so many of you here. Uh, and of course, the, the many hundreds I know we have uh, online as well for tonight's very special event, which we are doing uh, in partnership uh, with our friends uh, at Longevity Week. This is part of what has been a theme through the year of what could go uh, right. And tonight we're asking the question, what could go right for health? And I couldn't imagine anyone uh, more expert as a guide to that than tonight's distinguished speaker, Professor Sir John Bell. As you all know, Sir John is the Regis Professor of Medicine at the University of Oxford and a hugely respected worldwide figure in the fields of genetics and immunology, among many other things. But John's influence extends hugely beyond that, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, he's one of our most widely consulted, energetic and authoritative national figures on all matters. Health, he was one of the very few trusted voices during COVID, playing a leading role in the development of uh, LFT and PCR testing during uh, the pandemic. Uh, he is a government life sciences champion, uh, author of the life sciences industrial strategy, uh, and chair, as you have sure you've seen, of Our Future, of the Our Future Health program, which is the UK's largest ever uh, health study, which you may have seen launched just last week. I mean, John may some, say some more about that uh, later on this evening. He brings unrivaled knowledge of the challenges facing uh, the health ecosystem from labs to local communities, from hospital wards to the corridors of power. Uh, and we hugely look forward to hearing from him later on uh, this evening. Uh, at this critical time for us, for the NHS and for the wider nation on all matters health. This theme fits brilliantly well uh, with some of the work the RSA has been doing uh, with the Health Foundation uh, over the most recent past as part of the Economies for Healthier Lives program. Uh, we're going to hear some more about that program and the liberations uh, that took place this afternoon from Dem Julia Cleverden, who is sitting just here uh, in a second. Also, they're looking forward to your thoughts here in the room and indeed online. If you are online, you can post in the chat or on Twitter using the hashtag RSA Health. We'll try to get through as many of you, uh, your questions as possible by 7 o'clock prompt uh, when we wrap up. But without that, uh, with that and without further ado, please join me and welcome to the stage tonight's distinguished speaker, Professor Sir John Bell. John, the floor is yours. Thanks, Andy, very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here to be able to talk about this um, tonight. Um, this is, a, incidentally, I've had the tour. This is a splendid building. I'm really very impressed with the, with the RSA. You've done a great job over many centuries. And let me take you through what I hope will be a cheery talk. It's about healthcare delivery, so you're going to immediately, your shoulders will go down and you say, how can he make that cheery? Well, I'm going to do my best. Um, and. Um, and I'm going to start by reminding you that the last 30 to 40 years have been a terrific time for biomedicine. I mean, probably the best time in all its history in terms of what it's delivered on the basis of innovation. And this is a sort of short list of the, some of the things we've done. It, yeah, as, as you know, cardiovascular mortality has fallen by 70%. We've got drugs for viral infections. We've got vaccines for everything you can think of. New immune therapies are curing cancer, really curing cancer for the first time ever. We've got a whole array of drugs for inflammatory diseases. We've got the new drugs for dementia and obesity, imaging interventions. We've sequenced the genome many millions of times. And interestingly, we've expended life, extended life expectancy in the last 35 years by 19 years. That's probably the biggest achievement mankind has ever made. I, can't, I mean, going to the moon is good. But that, that is not extending life expectancy by 19 years. So this has been a terrific run. Um, and hopefully, there will be more to come. But remember, it's innovation that's done this. It hasn't been health systems doing this and that. It's really largely innovative activities and products that, which have made most of those changes. Um, 
and this is what it's done in terms of demography going back to 1800, shortly after you guys started this place. You can see things were not good. It was all red on the map. Things got a lot better by 1950, but now look at this. You know, most of the world is zinging along at a really pretty impressive level. And so that shift in demography is really reflects some of those innovations I showed you before. But what we also know that health systems all over the world are really under a pretty serious constraint. And that's partly due to the shifting demography, but also due to the fact that the burden on those health systems has largely shifted to being a set of big chronic diseases that occur in the aging population. And the fact that we have a system that's designed to treat people when they get symptomatic at the end of the natural history of their diseases. So we wait till people get chest pain, then we treat them for heart disease. We wait till they have a lump in their tummy and in A&E, and then we find they've got a cancer. It's a kind of late stage oriented, I call it a 1950s model, because it kind of worked in 1950. That's what we set the health service up, to, was to deal with that, and it did rather well. We don't have any digital infrastructure to speak of. We don't really to adopt technology. There's a big funding gap. Uh, workforce models flawed, no demand management. It's a bit of a mess, actually, if you want to know the honest truth. So at the moment, things are not really going so well. But having said that, three years ago, and I thought I should mention this, you know, when we're zinging along, you're introducing innovation, reduce the regulatory burden, and throw money at it. We can really do stuff well. And although we started badly in the pandemic, and I would accept we did start badly, the reality is we did really well in the pandemic, and we did better than almost any other Western country, any country period. We, of course, had better evaluation of therapies than anybody with our trials. We had our own vaccine, which don't believe the telegraph. It was still a great vaccine, saved six million, six million lives. Um, uh, our own testing developed here, which was terrific. And we had fantastic epidemiology that told us what was happening where the digital tools worked terrifically well. So, so underneath this, um, NHS, which we, we, we love to love and we love to hate. The truth is there's capacity to do a number of really exciting things. And we showed we could do that in the pandemic. And Lord Bethel, who's here in the third line, he, he and I did a few of these things together. And it was terrific, actually. It was exhilarating and hugely powerful. But let's get back to the NHS, because we, I think there's a view that since 1950, we thought, well, l l get used to it. It's a cheap and cheerful system. It's not going to be perfect. We'll have to get by on what we've got. It'll all be fine. The reality is, of course, it's not cheap at all. In fact, it's one of the more expensive systems. As you can see, just in terms of um, for a share of GDP, the UK is there. It's sitting nestled between the Netherlands and Denmark. We put much more money in it than New Zealand, Australia, Spain, lots of countries. And of course, last year, uh, and that's the triangle at the top. We were the second most expensive healthcare system, second only to the US. So we're not cheap and cheerful. We're actually pretty expensive. So most people go, oh, my God, I didn't know that. I, I thought we were cheap and cheerful. Well, we're not. It's, uh, we spend a lot of money in the healthcare system. And the, um, uh, and, and that, this is another illustration of what's happened. And you can see that if you look at public spending on health, in real terms, but also adjusting for population, we've had a really dramatic increase in the amount of money we've spent. And it's a publicly funded, uh, a taxpayer funded healthcare system. And it, it, it isn't a small amount of money, it's a lot amount of money. And for those who have been in government, they, you can see they all go, oh my gosh, we're spending you know, more than half the money on the healthcare system. And that's true. Now that might be the right, I'm not gonna make a judgment about whether that's the right thing to do or not, I'm just gonna point it out. But then if you take that data, expensive healthcare system, then how are we doing with our outcomes? The avoid avoidable mortality, which is a surrogate for all the outcomes in most diseases, uh, we don't do so well. We're right at the bottom of the pack. Just about the same as Greece, and just a bit of head. Uh, the good thing about America is we'll never be the bottom of the rankings. <laughs> and that's shown here, so that's kind of helpful, but it's still, I mean, we shouldn't be very proud of this, frankly, because this is not a great place to be. So expensive, outcomes are terrible. And one of the key themes that when you think about how can that be is that the system is actually turns out to be quite technology averse. And 
You can see it again in this. Uh, this is, this, uh, these are uh, slides from the King's Fund report, which is quite nice, which compared health care systems around the world. But you can see that our drug spending is much lower than everybody else, much lower than everybody else, uh, you know, um, half what it is in Spain. And yet they have much better outcomes. And the overall system is cheaper. So work that one out. doesn't really add up. And when you look at our ability to bring in technology, and you look at the numbers of CT scanners, MRI scanners, we're way down over there, and we're almost, we're not quite half what the next um, uh, country is, which is Canada, which is also not doing so well. So we're not great at, a, at, a, at, at taking this technology on. And that's reflected, I think, most profoundly in our digital system. So our digital, we should have the best digital systems in the world for our health. In fact, we don't. It's pretty chunky. And one of the reasons is that the funding to support it always gets stolen when, there, there's a, when people say, well, we don't quite have enough money. Take the money out of the digital budget. So this is just something from the Health Service Journal this year, which shows, oh, God, let's just take more money. And to be clear, I think we're going to get another one of those soon because they're paying for the cost of the strikes at the moment, and the money's going to come straight out of the digital budget, I suspect. So we don't, we don't, it's not as if we really... Um, uh, recognize the importance of these technology and innovative developments in a way of changing the system. So some bright spark in the NHS say, oh, well, we know what the problem is, don't have enough doctors. Let's train some more doctors. So we're not short of doctors, guys. Look at this. Oh, my goodness me. And since 2019, we've added about 10 to about 12 percent to the number of doctors in the system. The number of doctors has gone through the bloody roof. And what's interesting is the more doctors you train, the faster productivity falls. So this is quite an interesting phenomenon because everything's, oh, well, what we need is more doctors. Well, I can tell you the last time we did this, productivity fell. That was with the boost in medical students that we had at the, in, in the year 2000. When they all hit the system, guess what happened? Productivity fell. It's going to be, it's going to be the same thing all over again. And I've made the analogy that is sometimes quoted, and that is, if you were fighting the Battle of the Somme and you were sending the guys over the front, it's best not to send more guys over the front until you work out what's, what's, fine, what's, what's not working out so well as they cross the no man's land. So, and that, we're sort of doing that to the medical profession because you know, there are really serious issues about keeping doctors happy and content and productive in the workforce. Uh, and there you are, there's healthcare productivity. You can see, we trained all those doctors in the previous slide, you can see, eh, falling off a cliff. So, I, so there are, you know, there's some, and to be clear, I'm not an economist and I don't, you know, this is not the sort of stuff I do, but you know, there's, there's a story emerging here and that is we have some fundamental things wrong here. And unless we fix the fundamentals, we're not gonna have a healthcare system that works. So, um, one of the things which has also become evident post-COVID, and the, the economists in the audience, audience will recognize this, is from John Murdoch, uh, Burns Murdoch, who's done some rather nice things in the FD, and, I, and we can debate the exact, I know there's been debate about this, but in broad terms, since COVID, we've had this massive number of people who are not in the workforce. So I've found it very difficult to get Treasury's attention on any of this stuff until they started to look at this. And then they went, oh gosh, that's not so good. 20% of the unemployed population have a chronic medical condition. That ain't good. That is a massive drag on the economy. So we should probably try and work out what's going on there and what it is. And of course, you can see if we break it down, I mean, there's a few retired old guys at the top. That's fine. Don't worry about that. Students, of course, students don't get out of bed till 11, so they're out of the workforce, so that's fine. <laughs> but then everything else is chronic health conditions. And, and, and you know, the, the other thing is that, you know, people like to break these down into different diseases. This is all exactly the same disease. It's not, they're not really different diseases. These are, this is the, these are cro the chronic comorbidities that you get in, in people over the age of 50. And it is epidemic at the moment. And that is a massive drag. It's killing productivity. It's killing economic growth. And everybody, including Treasury, should be really worried about that. So as I thought about this, I thought, okay, okay, I get it. I saw that thing and I thought, okay, well, let's just write down the list. And with John Simons, we were writing a paper on what do we do in life sciences. We said, well, let's find the things that are really killing 
healthcare and really damaging the healthcare system because the pressure from these things are really profound. So we wrote the list down. This is our list of health missions. And, and I, I, I didn't really think about it very hard, but you know, they're the obvious ones. Obesity, cardiovascular disease, particular cardiovascular prevention, cancer, dementia, chronic respiratory ailments, mental health, aging, and prevention. Those are the things that are really key issues for the healthcare system. And then I thought, well, I wonder how the NHS is doing and all that. So I put an ast I didn't put the asterisk at the end when they were doing well. I put it at the end when they were providing really bad services in those domains. So we don't do really any serious attempt to fix obesity. It's not if you go see your GP and you're a bit too heavy, he doesn't want to know. He doesn't want to help you. It, nothing happens. Very few hospitals have obesity services. Although if you come in with a coronary, they look after you pretty well. But cardiovascular prevention is not good in this country. In fact, it's terrible. We do cancer OK. Dementia is terrible. Respiratory disease is terrible. Mental health, there's nothing. Aging, there's nothing. And prevention, there's nothing. So, so when you line up the diseases with what the healthcare system delivers, and if you accept that these are the big problems that are driving what I just showed you in the previous slide, then we got a problem, because there's a disconnect between the two entities. Now, there's another very interesting phenomena, and that is these are not individual diseases. So everyone thinks, ah, I've got diabetes. Actually, you don't have diabetes. You're, you've got one of the many comorbidities that live together. And this is a really good slide from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is really nice, because the, when they talk about long-term conditions, you talk about how many of them you've got. You can see by the time you're the age of 50, you've got at least one. But a, Quite a number of people have two, three, and four. So these, these hunt together as a pack. These diseases, the ones on the previous slide, they hunt together as a pack. So you very seldom find one where you don't find two, three, and four. And by the time you get to 75 to 84, look at that. Almost the whole population, they all have one, but a heck of a lot of them have got four of them all piled up together. These are the same clinical syndrome. And that's really fundamental, because we haven't organized the healthcare system to think of this as one disease. We've got the cardiologist over there, and we've got the endocrinologist over there, and we've got the stroke doctor here, and we've got the cancer doctor there. So we treat them as separate. This is the same disease, and it's got the same risk factors, and it has the same impact uh, across populations. So this is, this is a really important insight that's really only just come forward, and it shows why some of the problems are not going to get fixed. And the, and the disease I like to show, which is really central to this, is obesity. So as I mentioned before, the health service doesn't believe in obesity. So OK, that's fine. I get it. But it's 26% of the adult population. Uh, and in the people who are overweight, it's more like 35 or almost 40%. In America, incidentally, again, America is doing a lot better than us. There are 50% of the population are obese. So, so we're busy catching up. It, it's, I've been trying to get GDP numbers. Andy can probably correct me on this. But this is really hard to calculate because you see that tree? If you just calculate it for obesity, you get the wrong answer. You've got to calculate the downstream effects as you cause other diseases. And I'm reckoning it's, I reckon it's much closer to 10% than it is to 3%. So take 10% out of the GDP. That's a big number. Oh my goodness me. It's the major source of comorbidity, and it's largely unaddressed by the healthcare system. So obesity gives, it's a truncal disease, gives rise to half the common cancers. It's the biggest risk factor for half the common cancers. Diabetes is directly associated with it, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, chronic renal failure, joint disease, mental health. And I, I had to stop there because my PA said, I can't find any more branches to put names on. <laughs> so I thought, OK, I get it. I, I'll make the point with my modest tree. But this is the full list. So you take 78 diseases. The ones that are colored have an increased risk in people who are obese. The darker the, the band, the higher the increased risk. But you can see the whole bloody list is related. If you're obese, you're at higher risk of every, almost every disease in the textbook. Aortic stenosis, mental health conditions, the lot. I mean, it is remarkable. And it all starts with obesity. So you know. Why then do we not treat obesity? Well, you know, that's a pretty central question, actually. And it's not just treating obesity, it's managing obesity as a societal problem. So, you know, should the government take it seriously? Yes, they should. Should we have fiscal measures? We probably should. Should we do lots of other things to try and deal with this problem? We absolutely should. But for some reason, people have managed to compartmentalize this and not deal with it in the way that it should. 
Now, remember I mentioned this comorbidity problem. Well, this is a slide from the same paper. This is a finished paper, nice paper. And you can see the blue line is the risk of comorbidity if you have a normal weight. And the red line is the comorbidities you get if you're obese. So look, and that's one comorbidity at the top, two and three. So the bigger you are, the more, co so that whole list, you can feed the whole list as comorbidities. And there are two big studies, you can, bang, bang, in the finished study, they show exactly the same thing. It's a really profound and important observation. So that's why I get back to this point. These are all the same diseases, guys. Get used to it. And if you fix some of this, you're likely to fix things across the whole spectrum of pathology. It's just we haven't got a system designed to even think about that at the moment. Now, one of the other problems that happened, and one of the reasons we're in a bit of a state, is that the, the, re the, the regulators of uh, pharmaceutical medicines discouraged pharma companies from working in the area of the big, the 10 big chronic diseases. And they did it by saying, well, we're really interested in rare diseases, so we will incentivize you to work in the rare disease space. And this is a, a nice slide from Clive Meanwell, who works in this space. But if you look at the difference between 2000 and 2020, in the revenue from the top 10 drugs, the industry's doing well, because total revenue from the top 10 selling drugs went up two and a half fold. But if you then look at the population served by those top 10 drugs, it fell by sixfold, because the, the regulators pushed people to look at rare diseases where you could actually have quite a big impact, and you could charge very high prices for the rare disease drugs. But in fact, if you do the product of that by that, there's a 16-fold difference for what you're getting out of the pharmaceutical industry. So that's a problem, I think, because the big diseases, which are all over there on the right, the, the industry basically stopped working on them because they said, well, why should we do that? We can treat rare diseases and we can make a lot of money, rare cancers, uh, rare diseases like cystic fibrosis, where we've been hugely successful. But what we've done is we've left all these other diseases on the sidelines. So that's sort of the problem. And we've put that, we've dropped that into this healthcare system, which is a model that waits till people get sick at the end of life, despite the fact that their diseases all started 20, 30, 40 years before they appear. And as a result, we spend 10% of healthcare expenditure in the last year of life. These are all people with the end stage disease. You can't really do much more than palliate, and you certainly can't change the course of their diseases. So um, now it gets, so I did promise you, and it does get chirpier now. So sorry about that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm going to stick to the script now. So, so, so there, there is a way to fix this. And the way to fix that is to get back to some of the fundamentals of public health and what I call precision public health. And there are really three things that we need to do a lot better. We need to predict risk in people, and we need to use that to help prevent disease from the get-go. And we can now, that was actually quite hard to do, but it's now a lot easier to do because there's lots of, of interesting tools that you can use to predict, predict people's risk, uh, including their, their previous healthcare record. And then you've got to diagnose these diseases when they're still asymptomatic. So if you wait till somebody's symptomatic, you're pretty much done. So you have to diagnose these diseases earlier. There are lots of tools that we can do to do that. And then ideally, you want to treat the underlying causes, the risk factors, you want to treat them early. And there we're getting much better at this. And that paradigm is going to be the way that we fix the healthcare system. And what we need to do is move this new model of care to start for much further to the left. Disease prediction, health screening, prevention, early diagnosis, early intervention. And then you can flatten that morbidity curve and people are going to have much healthier lives. They're going to stay in the workforce, they're going to be much better in their own right, there, and, and they'll live uh, hopefully very long and, and happy lives. And we can extend life expectancy, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but it's the quality of life over those last 20 years, which I think is really the pivotal story. So, um, this, I mean, there's a very um, timely week for this because there, the American Health uh, Heart Association meetings were on the weekend. So I've dropped a few things into this. But as you know, we now have drugs for obesity. They can take your body weight down by about 20%. And the trials showing whether these are useful have just started to come out at scale. And as you saw from my 
trunk hole disease, obesity at the bottom, you might have imagined that if you treated obesity well, reduced people's weight, you could affect all those branches of the tree. Turns out it's absolutely right. The data is unbelievably stunning. This is the, this is the, the study that came from Nova Nordisk presented at that meeting this weekend. You can see that there's a massive 20% reduction in all the cardiovascular events. It reduces stroke, heart failure, heart attacks. It reduces your cholesterol. It reduces your blood pressure. It reduces all your inflammatory markers. You just need to lose weight. You don't need to use the drugs to do it. If you want to stop eating, that's all fine too. You can still get this stuff down. The trouble is we've been trying for 30 years to get people to stop eating. And curiously, it doesn't really work. So you're going to have to have a bit of a nudge. And that nudge works well. And, th and that, of course, reads through for death from any cause as well. So there's lots of other reasons besides cardiovascular disease that works. And then there are other, uh, other studies which are also coming down. This is a heart failure study. So if you use the same drugs, it also dramatically reduces heart failure. You can see the change in body weight in the bottom panel. But in, then in the top panel, that's, a, 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 that's evidence of how good your heart works. And for people with normal ejection fractions, it works dramatically well. There are also studies for mental health, which look really exciting coming through. There are studies for uh, chronic renal failure, which are coming through. That whole list of diseases, the trunks, you can fix all of them by just getting at some of the root causes. So this, that you start to say, well, hang on a minute. This is not so bad, because there's a way to fix this problem. Treat these people early, intervene early, and flatten that morbidity curve. And guess what? The industry has now woken up. And so we're now getting innovation that really does make a difference. So this is a type of drug which is called a siRNA. It's a genomic therapy. And what it is is you take a little bit of double-stranded RNA and you stick it in, and it blocks the, the activation of, the, of a particular gene. And in this case, it blocks the activation of a gene that's responsible for cholesterol metabolism. And as a result, if you, and, but the great thing about this is you give you a shot of this, it lasts a year. So all the problems, if, I, if you come into my clinic and I give you some statins, there's only a 25% chance you'll still be taking them six months later. Because of course people don't take them. They say, well, I don't need that. They feel well, what do I need that for? This, you solve that problem because you give them a jab and a year later they're still in pretty good shape. And that's, this is a 54% reduction in cholesterol levels in everybody. It's a huge impact and it lasts for a year. Well, it actually lasts for more than a year, but the, drug, the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know that because they can't sell so much. But, the, but you can see this is, I mean, this is really dramatic. And so this is a prevention. So I, this gets back to my point. We have the tools to prevent these diseases. And w we also have a way to diagnose these diseases early. And this is a early data using circulating DNA released by tumors to identify people with their cancers early. And you can see this is, a, this is one of the initial studies, a very big study going on at the moment. But if you take people and you say, look, I want a blood sample from you, and I'll see if I can find out whether you've got a tumor or not, you can see that actually the, the ability to identify the tumor, that's in the second, the number of people you identify the tumors in the second column, percentages on the right. For some tumors, it doesn't work very well. Prostate, it doesn't work. We knew it didn't work very well. But for gastrointestinal tumors, colorectal, esophageal, pancreas, look at that. You get almost all the pancreas tumors. You get almost all the esophageal tumors. And you get the vast majority of colorectal tumors. So would you like to have that test every other year from the age of 50? And then we'll flag you down and treat you at stage one or two? Of course you would. And so that's the kind of stuff that's available to shift. This is my shift to the left that I was talking about earlier. So we, we now are starting to get, we're getting drugs, siRNAs. We've got new siRNAs for a whole variety of different diseases. They last a long time. We've got the new uh, weight loss drugs. We've got new diagnostic technologies. We're in another renaissance of technology for medicine. Now, I have to give Andrew Scott credit for this, and I didn't tell him I was going to steal this quote. But I tell, when I heard this quote, I thought, oh my god, this is as good as get. It's not actually his quote. It's W.H. Autumn's quote. But he was the one who spotted it, so he gets credit for it. Health is a natural state to which medicine contributes nothing. There's some truth to that, but I think we do need to be a bit careful about overstating that. But this is why I worry about the expansion of physician numbers, because those guys 
trained as they currently are, they're not going to contribute to health. They're not going to help you not be obese. They're not going to help you prevent disease. You're not going to help you do all the things that we need to have done if we're going to fix the system. They're focused in their current model on late stage symptomatic disease. It's the wrong model. And with, with that in play, it's going to be really difficult to change healthcare systems because, as we know, they are deeply conservative. And that's not, I'm not, this is not a pejorative statement about the BMA, who I love dearly, but it is a problem. And I think it'll be hard necessarily for them to recognize that. So I, th there's lots going on that's going to make this new model of care look different. This is the study which was reported last week, which is called Our Future Health which we set up and started to recruit to a year ago. And the idea of this is to have a sandbox to work out what is finding people early, screening them for their health conditions early, diagnosing disease early, and treating them early. What does that actually do in the end? And so we've asked people to volunteer to see if they'd be part of this so that we can step in and see whether we can provide them with these tools and provide the evidence that show that this really works. And it, it's, it, it's a very simple thing. You fill out a form. We're trying to collect 5 million people. You go in to Boots, collect a blood sample. We give you your cholesterol levels, your blood pressure, your BMI. And then we link that to NHS records, and we recontact you and bring you in for studies. And we've had a terrific run on this. And the idea is to improve prediction. So we want to know who's at risk of what disease and tell them about what they're at risk at. We want to detection, detect those diseases as early as we can, ideally asymptomatically. And then we want better interventions. And, and, and the industry is going to help us with the better interventions, which is great. And this is a, a great figure. Sorry, you'll have to live through this. But each one of those dots is a person who signed up for this. We started a year ago. And you can see it's all over the whole of the UK. We've set, we started in hard to reach populations in, in the Midlands. But uh, every one of those is a, is a new person. We're actually now over a million. Sorry, that's slightly out of date. But, um, and you know, we've even got people way up in the um, for Breads of Scotland. We haven't started to collect up there. I don't know how they've signed up for this, but anyway, they have. Um, so, so let's pretend you could set that up on a national level. Then how do you actually deliver it? Well, one of the things we've been working on with the, with the Blair Institute, and he's been quite interested in this, is, a, is this concept of a low-cost, community-based delivery system that delivers early interventions, prevention, and health screening and we learned this from COVID. Because in COVID, we had tents in the parking lot. You go down, you get your vaccine. They call you in on your mobile phone. You go, you get it all done. We said, well, look, if we've done that for COVID, we can do it for lots of different things, including all the drugs I've showed you on this list. So it's what we call one shot. It, it, it's not one shot. It's about 20 shots. So get used to that. But, the, um, but there are all those things that you could deliver in that way. And they're all related to diseases that you can treat and prevent early. The drugs last a year. You can combine it with um, health screening. And you can, you can use all these. I won't go through the list, but you can see there's a whole list of things that you could do. It's really low cost, because you can buy the drugs at really at, volume, uh, at, at large volumes. And you can create in infrastructure, and it doesn't need any doctors. You can do it all with uh, non-medical health professionals. So, so this is a really high efficiency prevention system, and it would incorporate the our future health type stuff as health screening. So what we need is about 500 of these parked around the country, fed with these things, and then people will respond to that, and you will be able, I think, to really flatten the morbidity curve. So we're, we're kind of on the verge of getting this right. We've kind of, this is being piloted, wait for this, being piloted in Rwanda because they won't pilot it here. Anyway, we're piloting in Rwanda, and it's going rather well, thank you very much. So we just need to smarten up and get some of this stuff done at a better rate. So this is my chirpiest slide. The future healthcare could be bright. We've got a 1950s model of healthcare. It's run its course. We need to recognize that. Productivity's collapsed. Society's paying a high price. Not working. We need early intervention, prevention and early diagnosis. The central problem is not single rare diseases, but multimorbidity from chronic conditions. That's, I think, the big message. And these are all one disease. Innovation is really beginning to provide the solutions for this. We've got these great new therapies. We've got early diagnosis. We've got a whole ton of things. And we need a deployment mechanism, which is cheap and cheerful, to get back to my first slide. 
This would really be cheerful and cheerful, cheap and cheerful, and we'll get back to the roots of the NHS. Super. Take a seat. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for cheering me up. That was actually really optimistic. Um, initially to, uh, to Julia Cleveland here at the front, actually, who, um, one of my personal heroes, uh, champion of civil society and communities, thought long, deep and hard about... What's that mean? Um, these questions about health and community development. Um, Julia, I love your reflection on, on John's amazing talk. Is this working? That's working. It's not it's working. Out. But my lord, got into thought. Maybe. I'll try. Um, I spent this afternoon listening to the marvellous teams coming from Haven, Glasgow, Salford, Leeds, and Liverpool, uh, who've been working for two years to build the partnerships at a pretty local level to understand the relationship between economic development and health inequalities. And I think we've got you five places who just love your support, uh, A, to get involved in our future health, B, to find the 500 places where we could flatten the curve, and C, to take the point that you make so powerfully about the deployment is in communities. All my experience, I only work in places beginning with B, so I've done seven years in Burslem, seven years in Burnley, and I'm just about to complete seven years in Blackpool. Uh, and Blackpool is probably one of the yeah. most unhealthy, uh, sickest places, but the most fun. Where else will you find 2,000 magicians who are all learning the dark arts? I mean, it's the most marvellous place. But in the Claremont team, which I chair, we have 9,000 people. 9,000 people, oh, that's better. 9,000 people in Claremont. They cost us 11 million pounds a year in the Blackpool Royal Infirmary because they are so unhealthy that we simply never know that two and a half thousand of those 9,000 are mentally ill, which causes the most major breakdowns. Uh, 1,200 of them have got the most dreadful respiratory and lungs, largely because 50% of the houses in Claremont are not fit for human habitation. Uh, 1,100 have health and respiratory, and 1,000 have raging diabetes. Now, the poor old GPs are doing their best, but they've got 800 asylum seekers living in the Metropole Hotel, so they can't really get out much to see what's going on in Claremont. So what we need, I believe, and I think that was what was so clearly coming out from the teams working on this, is a much stronger community base to tackle fitness, obesity, all the other things. So more power to your elbow. Tell us what we can do. So look, that's, I, I, I'm really glad you made that point because I didn't probably make it well enough, but the, we learned this, we actually we learned this with the vaccine, didn't we, James? And that is, people said, oh, vaccine hesitancy. And it's all the hard to reach groups. Actually, there wasn't any vaccine hesitancy. It's that they didn't have access to the bloody, because if you're trying, you know, if you're living in a place where you're in a deprived setting, you know, to find your way into the healthcare system and get a vaccine is actually really hard. So if you take it out to people, they are pretty enthusiastic about taking it up. And, and I think one of the things we learned from our future health is that the deprived populations are very keen to participate in this stuff. It's just they never get a chance. So put a little trolley out in, outside the co-op shopping center, invite people in, make it work. And, and our healthcare system, of course, is built around hospitals. So the hospitals are great pretty intimidating, but late stage disease oriented, 1950s style. Primary care overworked, really in trouble, can't do it. So you do need, you know, the one shot thing is really the third leg to the stool. And I think that's what we need. And it wouldn't be that expensive to create it if you wanted to do it. Just on that question, John, of cost. Yeah. Have you done any work yet about the cost of both the 500 vaccination centers and how that would stack up relative to the downstream cost of not doing Yeah, so this. so this is really interesting, and Andrew's been involved in this because we've been talking together about this. 
So I, I pitched this to Treasury about, uh, no, about two years ago. And I said, you know, guys, you got a massive problem. Because I saw that, I read the John Mur Mur Murdoch thing. I said, you guys got a massive problem. Yeah. And you better think about how you fund healthiness so that you can keep people in the workforce. And I can tell you, the door slammed shut so fast I could barely breathe. It was unbelievable. So I thought, boy, that's a bit weird. Anyway, they, I think they've kind of spotted it now because they keep running the numbers. And so we had a really interesting meeting and we talked to, there were people there from Treasury and they said, look, our problem is prevention is always difficult to justify because of course it's got a longer life than the five-year OBR rules of fiscal management, right? Because it does take longer than five years to get a lot of, the, a lot of these benefits. So can you think your way through what the economic model is going to be so we've enlisted that guy over there amongst a few others to try and think that, but as you know, these are not easy. This is really quite complicated to work out what the mm. downstream benefits of this will actually be. But some of, them, some of the numbers we can work out because we know a lot about the diseases involved, others less so, but we're gonna have a crack at trying to write this up and see whether we can produce a compelling economic case for the benefits of, of getting people away from these chronic disease multimorbidities. Fantastic. And I think it'll be a big, big step. I mean, I only heard today, I've found today, the first mental health study that's been done when you lose weight. And it was interesting, it was in long COVID. But, you know, if you lose a lot of weight in long COVID, your mental health gets a lot better. Yeah. It's really interesting. So, so that, anyway, I think we can, we can probably put together plausible numbers. But I, I, it's just, it's inconceivable that it's not going to pay for itself inconceivable the drugs are cheap the tent in the parking lot is cheap yeah the nurses that supply it are cheap everything's cheap so we should be you know <laughs> that's right we should we should get it to go well there's no one better than this guy over here which is andrew scott actually um fresh lbs uh and um founder of the longevity forum uh sponsor of longevity week listen let's go to the uh, what already had some audience participation haven't we uh let's have a bit more um Take some questions uh, in the room and then a few online uh, as well. We'll start at the back there. I'm going to wait for a... Ah. I've got a cheeky microphone just because we... Um, hi, I'm Anna. I'm from the RSA. We are joined today by our colleagues at the Health Foundation and others on the Economies for Healthier Life programme. A quick question, um, Sir John. Your reflection on how can allies to the healthcare system help turn things around, specifically thinking economic development, but any other allies that you see in making this transformation? Yeah, so, so this is something that we, we've thought about quite a lot, and that is... You know, there are lots of people who are aligned with, with uh, a, healthier, a healthier lifestyle and a more productive workforce, not least of which the commercial sector. So, you know, you're running a company, a big pharma company or Unilever or whatever have you. This is a massive problem. 26% of the people working for you have got, are obese, and chances are they're not working as hard as they might work. They're probably miserable. They've got mental health problems. You know, this, there's a massive reason why industry should be interested in improving productivity and improving health generally. So they turn out to be, I think, really powerful allies in this whole discussion. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole set of people in third sector functions and one thing or another who I think can line up. But there's also, you know, the other big community which I think are, are really interested in this and it's shown by the fact we've recruited a million people into our future i mean we're recruiting people so fast we can barely keep up is that the guy in the street gets it healthy lives long low morbidity levels people you know people like that it's really good so i don't think you're going to be pushing people to get this stuff done i think they'll be very enthusiastic so it's a really good question the question at the back there i think um I'm Alicia Weston. I'm, um, I run an organization called Bags of Taste, and we work with people in poverty to improve their diets. Um, I, I was looking at that list of, um, of, of uh, your target things, and I mean, they, they are, you, you correctly identified, of course, that they're mostly obesity related, but they're also really diet related. So if you're looking at that list, you've got obesity, obviously, cardiovascular, diet, cancer, obesity being the largest cause of cancer, um, but dementia, also diet related, uh, mental health, also diet related. And I'm just a little bit concerned that 
you're talking about getting people to eat less, but there is a whole school of thought coming out now in the diet world that actually one of the causes of obesity is that there's a deficiency of micronutrients because the quality of what people eat, are eating is so poor. So if you get them to eat even less of something that's actually poor quality, I'm just a little bit concerned that we're not tackling the root causes, which is something that we as an organization do. Yeah, so, so you're, there are multiple ways into the obesity thing, and definitely improving food quality is an important one. But I think there, there are two things. One is we've been trying to do the behavioral thing for 35 years. And you look at the numbers, it's definitely not working. The numbers are going up dramatically. Look at 26% of the adult population, soon to be 50% of the adult population. So we, it needs to be behavior plus, so it can't just be behavioral change. I think that's very true. Uh, but the second thing is, the interesting thing about the new drugs is they do stop you eating because it means that you feel full and you don't, and, and you can look at the clinical trial results it fixes all kinds of things. So I'm, I'm not sure that it's correct to say that eating less on its own might not have quite a profound effect. And, and it does in the same way that bariatric surgery has, has quite a profound effect. So, so I think, I, so I'm, I'm pretty holistic about this. I'm also holistic about the ways to fix it because I would really love the government to say, and by the way, guys, we're gonna whack up a food tax on all these really terrible foods you're all eating. Why would you not? I mean, you don't want people to go commit suicide. But, uh, and they are committing suicide by eating this stuff continuously. And it's kind of not their fault because they're cheap. They're easy to get access to. Poor people don't have much choice. So, you know, we need to help that. And, and maybe you, you tax this and you subsidize that. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's, this is not rocket science. So I'm a real believer in that. But I also think, like many things in medicine, you just need that little extra bit of innovative therapy to actually help people to get over the line. So, I'm, I, so I totally get it, and I think you're right, yeah. I'm gonna take one of the uh, online questions and go to a um, question over here. Um, lots of people asking, John, about the role of AI and the role of e-health technologies in delivering on the agenda that you've, you've set out here. So, so the AI thing is really important. So the, the great thing about our future health, it'll be the, lar the world's largest training set for AI in healthcare wow. by some margin. And there will be lots of things we don't know which are risk factors for disease that will allow us to tune our predictive capacity to say, you know, you're at much higher risk of breast cancer, you're much higher risk of heart disease, you're much higher risk of diabetes. And you'll get that a lot out of there are clinical records plus the things that we measure, genetics plus um, uh, proteomics plus all that stuff. So the ability to run an AI-driven disease prediction and prevention strategy is massive. And not only that, but you can tune it. Because, of course, one of the great things about AI is you can say to people, look, this is, how you, this is what you should do to prevent your disease. And then you can track them and say, uh, actually, that's not working for you, well, you should try something else. And you can give people alternatives as to what they need to do. So this gets back to trying to make the behavioral thing work a bit better, is you can actually tune people in terms of what they do. So I'm a huge fan of the AI agenda. And as you know, we've just landed Larry Ellison and his big new institute in Oxford, which is gonna be entirely AI driven. So there's gonna be huge opportunities, I think, to do that at scale. Fantastic. I go to the question over here. Yes. Hi, um, Dr. Tola de Biro. I'm from the National Academy for Social Prescribing. So you'll be surprised to hear that my question has a social element to it. So we've heard a lot about the, um, I mean, I'd sign up for a one shot immediately. I think it sounds incredible. But what about the wider determinants of health? Um, the uh, speaker here, who was talking about the poor housing conditions in Blackpool, what about people who are out of work who haven't got um, some type of long-term term condition? We haven't really heard how those would be addressed by the one shot. And then following on from that, we're talking about prevention, which is absolutely brilliant. What about the non-pharmacological interventions for prevention, like social prescribing? Where would they fit in? Yeah, so, so, so there's no question that there's going to be a whole barrage of different approaches to dealing with this, including social prescribing. The, the one-shot model could easily house the kind of 
advisory service that would actually allow you to do social prescribing better. It, it actually has the advantage that it would be community-based, close to people who need it. So th that is actually part of the model, is to try and embed it in that. I mean, I, I think my view is if you can't get people an injection once a year, you won't be able to do social prescribing. But once it's running, it should be great. And again, you don't need doctors to do so so social prescribing. I think that's one of the real strengths of that, is that you can have a different type of workforce that can drive all that stuff forward. So I think that's great. I, I, and, and, and obviously, behavioral, behavioral modification has a role to play. I just think it's been really difficult to demonstrate it as being a highly effective mechanism to deal with this problem. And it's partly because environmental factors, housing, for example, availability of terrible food at very cheap levels. It's, there are all kinds of factors that are driving people down to an environmental setup, which makes them really prone to this single cluster of diseases. And just get back, this is one disease. And it's caused by all those things, which are the environmental factors that produce this disorder. So, so would totally embrace the social prescribing stuff. I, I, I was trying to show that, that we're on a mission to try and fix the delivery of this, but you need a, a long list of things that you can deliver in that sort of setting. I'm going to say one more question online, then we'll come back uh, into, the, uh, into the room. There's a question here, John, about the, the role of um, businesses. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the hit to the workforce that's come from uh, ill health, which is huge, and we find skill and sh staff shortages all over the UK in every sector. Yeah, what is the role of business uh, in delivering better health for employees? Well, so, so th this, this gets tricky because there, there is a route in here to say to, to Unilever, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, Rolls Royce, BMW, you know, you employ so many tens of thousands of people, set up your own one shot in the front lobby or in the parking lot, off you go. And, and I promise you they will do it. But the problem is that you then end up with a divisive system because the guys with jobs in good, stable companies, they get the public health stuff. And the people who run shops down on the high street and are, you know, single shop owners and probably come from poor backgrounds, diverse in a whole variety of ways, they don't get access to this. So, so I think you've got to start with a public sector funded structure and then if Glaxo wants to bang up a tent in the parking lot, you can let them do that subsequently. But unless you get the core right, it's probably not, it's probably not going to be equitable, which is not right. I can see that. Uh, let's try here at the, uh, at the back. Thank you. Hello, uh, Cameron Shroyleff. So, John, you mentioned uh, in your survey of the scene earlier that uh, regulators had at one point um, shifted the interest of pharma companies towards rarer diseases and orphan diseases. Uh, and that's, uh, that incentivization has worked well in the sense that uh, yeah, they've that responded to it. Yeah, no, no, it's been hugely successful. But um, do you have any thoughts on how best to incentivize uh, pharma companies to now move, I think you hinted at some of these, but uh, what would be your most synthetic thoughts on how to incentivize pharma companies to work towards the, these multi morbidity, common cause diseases, you mentioned in particular uh, obesity, but also perhaps translational research on aging and commercialization yeah, no, of research this, into aging. This is a really interesting question because the, the regulatory paradigm for something like aging is actually quite, and multimorbidity is actually quite complex. And nobody's really worked out a decent regulatory paradigm for that. And, and that, you, you rightly said, that you know, the reason people did rare disease is the regulator said orphan diseases, easy route, small trials, off you go, see how well you get on. And that led to this great burst of activity in, in the orphan rare diseases. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. In fact, people with rare diseases would say, you know, that was pretty good for us. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing. All I'm saying is you do have to balance that by incenting the industry to get into some of these bigger indications. But I think what's happened, and this is recent, is that you'll find now many companies are starting to say population health, because the reality is, if you go back 20 years ago on my slide, 
the companies were doing really well with the statins, the antihypertensives, the big population health interventions. It was a heyday for the industry. And then it kind of got diverted into rare disease. So I think a lot of them has thought, oh my goodness me, dementia, obesity, diabetes, these are things we can really play in. And they've started really to make a big effort in that space. And it's interesting because the, the company that led the charge into precision medicine rare indications was Roche, which is a Swiss pharmaceutical company. They did incredibly well, produced some great products. It was really successful. Just in the last six months, they've bought into one of these siRNAs for hypertension, which is a one-year shot for hypertension. And as soon as that happened, I went, okay, the lads are getting the idea. They're going to start to shift into these wider indications, which I think will be really great for healthcare systems because what we need is more people working in that space. And we also have to procure these drugs at a population level to make them cheap enough to be able to use at a population level, which again is something that the NHS doesn't do very well. But you know, we need to say, fine, we, we, you know, we'll buy a lot of this and then distribute it across the country. So I think there are ways to make that happen, but it's a really important question. Back online, a um, number of questions, John, about mental health. I think your picture, mental health, was the biggest single cause big. of exit. It was big, it was big, it was big. And you also said that far too little was being done on that front. What is to be done? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think we all know about the provision of services for mental health in every country. It's, it's lamentable, actually, particularly given the size of the wave. And, and, you know, some of these mental health conditions are particularly dominant in, they're, they're not, you know, when you get to be my age, people could say, well, forget about him, he's not in the workforce anymore. But when you're 25 years old, yeah. you can't have those people out of the workforce. You're toast if you do that. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the really big challenges with mental health. We don't offer people anything to solve that problem. So we do need to try and get into that space. So... There, there is quite a lot of anecdotal evidence now that obesity, and it may be, there may be a biological component of this, but the, the obesity and overweight may be associated with really profound problems with mental health. Hmm. And the evidence that you can correct that is by losing weight, and not with the drugs, but just losing weight, you can actually significantly improve people's mental health. And who knows whether that's got something to do with self-esteem or whether it's got something more, much more biological to do with the fact that if you've got a lot of glucose running around the system, you know, it does have cerebral effects. It will change the way your brain's work. It, I don't know if any of you guys have got kids. If I give my kids an ice cream cone, 10 minutes after they eat the ice cream cone, they've gone completely bananas. So, you know, the, the, the idea that, that these food, the food doesn't affect the way you think and behave is completely crackers in my view. So we've got to try and understand that better. And I think you can make quite a profound difference if you get at it. But men mental health is probably one of the biggest single issues here. We're running out of time. But let's take a few more questions in the room. Maybe try here at the back. Thank you. Now come here. Thank you. And hello, my name's Amina. I, um, I led the um, government comorbidities framework uh, in 2014, I have a PhD on obesity from the social determinants of health perspective, supervised by Michael Marmot, who sat here a while back, and I'm a public health specialist. Um, now, I won't get into the details of uh, disagreeing on some of the root causes, because I'm sure you've heard that argument before, that the root causes go, are, are structural and economic and political, not necessarily genetic and pharma chemical. Um, but I want to ask another question, which is how do you stop our future health from becoming a kind of Facebook in that? I understand our future health is a company as well as a charity. How do you stop that from becoming a place where volunteers give their data that is then sold to private organizations who design products who are then sold back to the population? Yeah, no, thanks for that question. It's really important. We, we are a company simply in the sense we've got to be able to take money in through different routes to make it work. We don't sell anything. There's not, nothing for sale. It's all not for profit. So there's no money-making component to this at all. It's... Sorry, 
No, 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 they can't buy data. There's no data for sale. Let's be crystal clear about this. There is no data for sale. If companies want to, if companies are doing research on obesity and they want to come and apply to do studies in obesity in the population, then of course we welcome that because don't forget that almost every health intervention that we have actually goes through a commercial stage before it becomes used. It's got to be regulated, it's got to be distributed, and the likes. So all the effective things, that list on the front page, the first slide, all that had a commercial step on the road. And we want to help work with them to try and make sure that they can produce more exciting drugs like the obesity drugs, the inclusion drugs, the drugs for hypertension, and so on. So that, that's not, but just to be crystal clear, nothing is for sale in our future health. And we make that very clear in the, in the patient, uh, in the participant leaflet. Thanks for clarifying that, John. Uh, here. Hi, Eric Kilstrom from I'm a Social Entrepreneur, uh, Charity Trustee, and former director of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund for Healthy Aging. I um, would like to ask a two part question. One is um, I speak to heads of the ICBs and ICSs, and they say, um, I try to move budget from an acute center into the community and not over my dead body. So there's a, there's a question about how do you move money from acute settings to community settings? And the second part of that question is, I speak to trustees of NHS and they say, prevention doesn't work. It doesn't, there isn't a payoff in prevention. You know, they still have those costs at end of life. And this is right at the very top. Yeah, so, so there isn't, so it's interesting because if you go to America, that's exactly what you hear. And the reason is there's no alignment between the guys who pay for the prevention and the guys who benefit from the prevention. And that's, you know, that's, it's, w w I think what it means is that they will never be able to do this. If you have a single, if you have a single payer funded system, then prevention is demonstrably a huge benefit. And I can, all I need to do is point to that figure, 70% reduction in cardiovascular disease in my lifetime as a doctor. And that is largely due to the intervention of statins, hypertension control, screening for cardiovascular risks and dealing with it. And we can get it down another 70% if we want to. So I think there are really good examples in our current system of how it works. But you're absolutely right. Without alignment about who benefits, who pays up front and who benefits. And that's why the NHS and a single payer healthcare system is such a brilliant idea because it's the only system in which the whole thing actually lines up and works. Last question here at the front. Hey, I'm Andrew Steele. I'm a biologist. I've written a book called Ageless. So if, your question, if my question interests you, then please do follow up with that. Um, and I really enjoyed your talk. And we got one word on one slide, which was aging, with a little star by it. And we had one question about it earlier. But if I'm thinking about the medium term of the healthcare system, I'd basically re-give your entire talk, apart from rather than talking about obesity, I would talk about the aging uh, process. And, and look, it's fine. I, I mean, I picked obesity out. Mm -hmm. But it's all part of the, I mean, it is part of the same story. Yeah, and I think it's, it's just really important to emphasize how much bigger aging is than obesity. So if you look at all the, the numbers you put up for the increasing risk of disease, um, being overweight probably doubles your risk of heart disease or something like that. Being 80 rather than 40 multiplies yeah, that yeah. risk by yeah, 10. Yeah, 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 and yeah, so yeah. the thing that's really going to move the needle in the medium term is going to be investment in the basic science of aging. And although that doesn't feel like, I mean, I'm sure your colleagues at Treasury will be slamming the door even faster, but I think we need to make that case, you know, in the here and now you, you haven't read my life sciences vision there's a big <laughs> section on aging i'm very glad to hear it time. it's a really important piece of the puzzle yeah exactly although you're not going to fix it all with yamanaka factors just to be clear yeah <laughs> listen we are into overtime should we draw things to uh, close one very final question from me though john um you've set out brilliantly as ever how we do it and painted the optimistic vision. I'm super grateful for that. Last question, are you, are you optimistic that it will be done? Yeah, I, I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's harder than I thought, actually. But, I, but I, look, I think that one advantage of a burning platform is a burning platform. We've, I don't think there's any ambiguity we're on a burning platform. So we're going to have to pivot to do something different. And I think particularly with the array of innovations that are available to change the way we deal with prevention, early diagnosis, early therapeutics, 
I mean, you, you don't have to be the Regis Professor of Medicine to work this out, actually. It's quite, actually, if you, if, if you think about it, it does make a huge amount of sense. So that's a big advantage. And, and I, actually, talking to politicians across the spectrum, they do fundamentally get this. They're just not quite sure how to move a huge enterprise, which is the NHS, to a slightly better place in this space without losing some of the things that you've got. You, you don't want to shut the NHS down, but you want to just diversify a bit into this space. So anyway, because this is a happy talk, I'm absolutely positive. <laughs> <laughs> That's removed all doubt. Listen, we should, uh, sadly, time to uh, draw things to a close. Uh, huge thanks um, to you all for your patience at the start and for your amazing questions uh, during this session. I've hugely enjoyed and learned uh, from it. Uh, if you're an RSA fellow, you can continue the conversation after, uh, uh, the, pres uh, after the presentation tonight on, on Circle, our digital online uh, platform. Uh, we mentioned earlier on, and Anna mentioned, uh, our work on Economies for Healthier Lives, which is now out and is well worth uh, taking a look at, very closely aligned with the thoughts that both Julia and John have set out this evening. I mentioned our terrific partnership around Longevity Week, and Andrew is here. Uh, do check out the website some fantastic things on offer over the course of uh, this week from which uh, certainly I and I imagine some of you will learn from hugely if you're on uh, the chat or on social media that's on hashtag longevity week and finally last but by no means least uh, please uh, join me in thanking tonight's fantastic and fantastically optimistic speaker uh, John Bell <laughs>